Um, so thank you. Uh, I want to talk today about price manipulability in first price auctions, and this is joint work with Paul Ditting and Carla Subramanian C. Okay, so why do we look at these first price auctions? As many have mentioned before, they have seen recent widespread use in the display ads industry. And this is although we know that everyone knows that they're um, non truthful, and this non truthfulness in theory can cause frequent bid updates and other suboptimal behavior. But this is not only um, in theory, but also in practice. Um, it has been observed quite early on by Edelman and Ostrovsky that uh, this can yield very unstable bidding behavior. And so in an early work where they uh, got data from a search engine overture, which you might not remember. Um, so overture was selling these ad slots for by using first price auctions and the prices varied just within a very short period of time here between six and ten dollars and so edelman and ostrovsky concluded that this could not have been due to a sudden uh, change in value of the ad slot but uh, must have been due to strategic bidding and so in light of this our main question is um, how susceptible to bid manipulation are a large first price auctions so when there's a large number of bidders uh, we can summarize our contribution um, as in the following way. So first we introduce a new simple metric for price manipulability, and it's actually not totally new, but adopted from a recent paper by Lavi Satas and Soar, who use it to argue uh, a new design of the Bitcoin fee market and improvement. Um, but we, on the other hand, will use a similar metric to study the simple K unit first price auctions. And in particular, we will try to classify families of distributions by whether they induce truthfulness in the large um, with respect to our metric. And we will actually see uh, a very surprising division point uh, between where um, families of distributions will go from being non-truthful to truthful, uh, but more on that later. So let me introduce the model. It's a very simple K-unit first price auction where you just have N bidders uh, being sold uh, K copies of a single item. And uh, it, uh, it's important to note here that I'm taking BI, so the bids um, IID from some fixed distribution F. Uh, the allocation is simply we rank the bids in decreasing order, and then uh, each of the K highest bidders will receive one copy of the item. And since it's a first price auction, the winner just pays their bid. Now, the quantity we, we are interested in will be the minimum bid to win, which means that all other bids are being fixed, uh, ex post, what could one um, winning bidder have bid and still receive an item? Obviously, the smallest bid he could have made, she could have made, is BK plus one, right? And so we want to measure uh, this quantity. We do it in the following way. So each bidder I can shade their bid now from BI all the way down to BK plus one. And um, we take note of the relative change, which we say is one minus BK plus one over BI. And uh, if you just take an example, say you have three bidders and K is equal to two, then this would um, mean that if they bid seven, eight, and one, for example, then uh, the first two bidders would receive an item and would pay seven and eight, but the relative change would be one minus one over seven and one minus one over eight respectively. And this should denote the percentage that they can shade from their original bid. And um, some remarks on this relative change, while well, it will always be between zero and one where zero indicates there's really no room to shade and one means that you could have actually hit zero and still received an item. And uh, any value in between should be seen as the percentage of how much room there was to shade. Um, compared to your original bid. So what we measure in the end is the expected maximum relative change denoted by delta max, which is the expectation of the maximum overall winning bidders of this relative change quantity. But here we can see that clearly the max is attained by i equals one or the bidders with, bidder with the largest bid. And so this turns out to be one minus expectation of pk plus one over the largest bid. And again, our goal is to understand what happens to delta max as n grows very large. Now, our results uh, summarized in a table 
on the left-hand side, you simply have the number of items that could either be constant or uh, sublinear, think something like square root n, or linear in the end, which thinks something like one half n. Okay. And on top, we look at different families of distribution. So perhaps the most simple one so with bounded support and the two with non-bounded support would be MHR and alpha strong regular. And I want to say here that uh, we take these distributions to be not dependent or so independent of n. Okay. Nevertheless, the less there is a surprising result, but let's just start with some quick intuition with the simplest entry in this table on the top left. So if you, for example, take k is equal to one and in the bounded support case, then you would just be looking at, well, if you're the top bidder, then how much could you shade down? So meaning to the second largest bid. And uh, yeah, so just how much shading could you do? But obviously, um, as n goes to infinity, the uh, second largest bid will also tend to the supreme of the support of the, the distribution. And so there is no shading possible in the end which means that our quantity will be equal to zero. So for the other two uh, families of distributions, let me just introduce them quickly. There's the regular distributions, which you may know. Um, it's defined by phi of v is equal to v minus one minus the CDF over the PDF, and this should be weakly increasing in v. And then you have the alpha regular or alpha strongly regular distributions, um, where phi of v prime minus phi of v is greater or equal than alpha times v prime minus v. And you could uh, try to get some intuition for this, where we say, okay, obviously, as uh, alpha, so we take alpha between zero and one, first of all, and as alpha grows, um, well, the restriction or the condition on phi becomes more and more strict, or uh, seen in another way, if you start at alpha equals one and go down to zero, you're permitting um, distributions with uh, increasingly heavy tails. Mm -hmm. So if you also just substitute alpha equals zero, you get back the regular distribution. And if you substitute alpha equals one, on the other hand, you get an MHR distribution or monotone hazard rate, right? You might have seen this under a different definition, which is just PDF over one minus the CDF is weakly increasing. So although these MHR distributions are you know, studied in their own right and quite interesting, because they frequently come up in Real world applications. And here we see them as just a one end of a continuum of families of distribution. And so we may rightly guess that uh, in most cases they will behave similarly. So MHR and uh, alpha strongly regular should behave similarly, probably um, seen under, uh, under most scopes. But uh, in our case, this is where the surprising result comes in. Um, we notice that under our metric, they actually behave differently. So in the case where k is constant, um, MHR distributions will actually not allow for any bit shading by our definition. And whereas even for k constant alpha strongly regular distributions will allow for bit shading. And then we also get that when k is equal to square root n, actually um, now MHR agrees with the result of alpha strongly regular. Okay. So let me give a very brief um, uh, explanation of uh, how we got to these results. So recall that the metric is just the limit of n goes to infinity of one minus the expectation of bk plus one over b1. And since these bi are drawn by id from a fixed distribution, this uh, actually they will correspond to just the order statistics. And so now it seems to require that we need to get a fine grade understanding of the first and k plus first order statistic. And um, not only that, um, we need to do it for a whole class of distributions, even though it's already not easy for a single one. And so it seems that we would really, um, since this is very difficult, it seems we would need a, a simplifying reduction to, to deal with this. And this comes in form of a key lemma where an important quantity is this Tm, which we denote the uh, median of the max of m draws. And the lemma says that if for all n, we have that the limit of this fraction of medians, uh, Tn over Tnl goes to one, then the limit of 
the expectation of the quantity we're interested in x2 over x1 or the second largest over the largest bit is equal to one and so now this seems to be only useful for uh, k equals one but actually it works for uh, k constant mm -hmm. and just a quick intuition for for these medians uh, what's really going on is that um, for l large enough we can basically have um, this interval tn tn l containing um, both x2 and x1 with high probability for all n. And so then as n goes to infinity, if we also assume that this fraction is equal to one, tn over tn l, then we have the uh, result we require for the expectation. And the converse is also true. Um, so if you take the second largest out of, uh, out of n bit, uh, two n bits, uh, being st uh, strictly less than tn, this occurs with probability at least one quarter, and the largest being greater than t two uh, n, this will be equal to one half. Now, in the uh, converse, we're of course interested uh, in both of these events occurring at the same time. So you would uh, look at the second max being in the purple region and the first max in in the red region, and then being se separated by this gap t n t two n. All right, and um, by independence, um, we can also lower bound the probability of both these events occurring by a constant. Okay? And then if we moreover uh, take, um, or we can somehow show that the limit of Tn over T2 and the size of this gap is strictly less than one as the limit goes to infinity, then we also have that essentially bit chaining occurs. Okay. Now, um, uh, this is, essentially what I wanted to say. Um, but let me just summarize that we have found a reduction of dealing with these order statistics. Instead, we now look at much more conveniently these uh, median of maximum. So we have these two cases that cover everything. Either you have for all constants, the limit of this fraction is equal to one, or there exists a constant for, for which uh, Tn over Tnp is strictly less than one. And in both cases, we know what the conclusion is. And um, luckily, for example, for uh, MHR distributions, uh, this really uh, makes things much easier since um, these limits turn out to be actually computable. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let me just finish with some open questions. Um, so we have shown that in the case of MHR distributions, that um, so bit shading cannot occur, right, for, for constant k. But it does not vanish when k is at least square root n. So there is some gap there, and we might want to resolve uh, where exactly does uh, bit shading vanish. And moreover, you can, of course, generalize the study to feasibility constraints beyond k units, such as, say, matroids and beyond. And also, you can consider probabilistic participation of agents. Right? Um, one more interesting point would be, well, we looked at the asymptotic behavior, so n growing very large, but what about if there's some finite number of agents participating? And this could also be coupled um, with some studies uh, on real data. I think. And finally, our metric is not specifically tailored to work first price auctions, but it could also be great to look at applications to other non-truthful auctions, such as GSP or generalized uh, second price auction. And that is all I wanted to say, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great talk, very interesting work. So uh, I take questions. Okay, so uh, I, I have a, a question. Uh, do you have any intuition on uh, what this type of analysis uh, would show if we assume heterogeneous uh, uh, bidders with different average values, because the, the main motivation for a bidder to, to actually bid strategically is when his value is higher than the value of, of the next bidder, then he can actually have gains. So do you have any intuition or analysis on this? Um, no, no, but so I, I don't have any, definitely no analysis on this, but my intuition is that, I mean, if one bidder is really much smaller than maybe that bidder would not be part of the analysis kind of um, because then you would 
so so I think it would really depend on um, how many bidders are how much smaller, and then also depending on K, so how many items you're selling. Mm -hmm. um, but I so I think it could make for actually an interesting question now that I think about it. So, depending on the gap you say between the depending the, on how many items you sell and yeah. That's right. And as the gap in, in values increases, then maybe it would be harder to maintain a truthfulness or, yes, or maybe yes. not. So that's interesting. Yes. yes.